Bulletproof Radio, a state of high performance. Hey, it's Dave Asprey with Bulletproof Radio. Today's cool fact of the day is that if you're worried the plastic that you throw away will just stay on the earth forever, and maybe take in a valuable space, there's some new information for you. Yale students have discovered a solution in the jungles of Ecuador. It's a fungus called, I'm going to try and say this right, but I'm going to say it wrong. It's called Pestalatiopsis. Pestalatiopsis. I don't actually verify that I said that right. Microspora, which can survive only on polyurethane, which is pretty interesting. In fact, it can eat polyurethane in an anaerobic environment, means no oxygen, like at the bottom of a landfill. Now, if you were to take said rainforest where they found this thing and light it on fire and kill all of this magic fungus, then you wouldn't have the magic fungus and then we wouldn't be able to have fungus that eats plastic. And that's pretty cool. Unless, of course, you have a polyurethane heart implant and the fungus is eating that, in which case you're pretty much screwed. So we got to think about this whole thing. But anyway, it's kind of cool that there is a fungus among us that can help us. Now, if you haven't had a chance to check out the Dave Asprey quarterly box, you need to head on over to quarterly.co slash product slash Dave Asprey or just search for Asprey quarterly. You'll find it. Once a quarter, I send out a box that, that costs a hundred bucks and it always has a lot more value than that inside it. I, I handpick biohacking stuff, not my stuff, other people's stuff, really cool things. I get a special deal on it for you and I put it all into a package. You don't know what you're gonna get, but I guarantee it'll be cool and I spend a lot of time picking this stuff out because I like to play with toys and this lets me play with all the toys, right? So go to quarterly.co, find the Dave Asprey box and sign up and I'll send you something really, really cool that you're not expecting. All right, today's guest is not a stranger to Bulletproof Radio. He's a good personal friend founder of well.org, the editor of Be More magazine, the author of a book called Rise and Shine, and author of a brand new book that's just coming out called The Urban Monk. I'm talking about none other than Pedram Sholjai. Pedram, welcome to Bulletproof Radio. Great to see you, Dave. Good to be here again. I don't know if that was a good intro because you've done all sorts of other stuff, including you have uh, The Urban Monk podcast, you have The Health Bridge podcast, uh, you filmed Origins, uh, the movie, and I was a uh, feature in the movie, and you were also a guest in Moldy, the movie. So basically, you and I are traveling some pretty similar paths, and anytime I get to, a chance to interview you or just chat with you, it's always a chance to learn something, because you're like a Taoist monk, and you know how to levitate and stuff like that, right? Yeah, the levitation thing, I just, I stopped doing it because it got kind of old. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and uh, just a, an interesting point, you are a new father as of like two days ago? Two days ago, like thanks for even man. thanks for taking time to even come on the radio and uh, and talk after that. So I apologize for keeping you away from your new little one, but I'm sure that that uh, she's asleep already, so you don't have to worry about it. Yeah, well, you know the thing about having a new little one is that as a dad, I realize how useless I am without mammary glands that function right because it's yeah. just like hey, uh, honey, she's crying. I'll I'll just hold her until you're ready. There, like, there's, I, a, I, there's a biohack for that. It, it's well known that men can actually produce breast milk. Just keep eating Twinkies, right? I, I think that's how you do it. <laughs> Parabens shampoo. I haven't actually tried the biohack. It's not really high in my list of things to do, but <laughs> uh, apparently it's possible. And if it did happen, <laughs> don't feed that to anyone because that's just gross. <laughs> now. Uh, you're, you do a few other things, though, that I didn't also say, aside from The Urban Monk, your new book. And all right, I just got to plug it because I'm really excited for it. It's theurbanmonk.com? Yep. All right, cool. And people can go there and sign up, and you'll send them basically showers of jewels and stuff like that? Yeah, the kind, that, the kind that'll last way longer, right? It's uh, <laughs> you know, lots of med- meditation training, lots of Qigong training, uh, uh, basically time hacks, all sorts of things that help people kind of get through the modern uh, lifestyles that we live because my whole thing is you can't run for the hills anymore. So what are you going to do in your life here and now? What, do, what are you going to do in your world to be able to have peace and not try to like, you know, go off to some retreat and think you're going to find it? So, you know, it's just practical ways of living in our world. All right. You're qualified to talk about this because I didn't say this because, well, we're friends and all, but you're a doctor of oriental medicine, you're a kung fu master, a world traveler, a devout alchemist, a qigong master, and a, actually you're a Jedi? Is, is, this, is this true? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so Absolutely. these are these are not the droids yeah. you're looking for. So these are yeah, these are these are not the droids. It sounds like I'm the president of the Overdoers Anonymous Club <laughs> around here. I didn't, I don't even remember doing all that stuff. Yeah, but but it's actually all true, right? And that's that's one of the yeah, oh, absolutely, absolutely. Like, like your book is um, is meaningful because it doesn't come from a position of oh hey look you know something happened. You're like I've been on this path for many years. I've studied throughout Asia, and so this is one of the reasons I have great respect for for the things you say, and. Today, though, I, I wanted to talk about some of the things that are in the book, uh, basically hacks that people can do to have that sense of, of we'll call it presence or inner awareness. or I don't, What do you call that state that, you, that you're able to maintain even in a, in a city environment versus going out and sitting by a waterfall next to a Japanese painting? Uh, which is, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's called being, being an urban monk, right? It's about yeah. being present in, your, in the now and not in some sort of weird abstract way, just using ways to kind of tie back in, to tap into your physiology, tap into parts of your, your day that kind of bring you back into the moment so that you're not sitting out there projecting about what tomorrow brings and worrying about the 50 million things that you know, are, are coming later today that you can't do anything about now and learning how to just kind of open one window at a time, take care of business, close it, go to the next one, instead of having multiple windows open wondering why you can't multitask. Right, I, I totally understand that. You've so you have this idea of presence, and it is harder to be present in a crowded urban environment full of noise and distractions and fast food and advertising and all that kind of stuff. I mean, I, I live on Vancouver Island. I'm actually looking at a bald eagle right now. If I tip my head, like actually there is one right outside that lives in my backyard. Uh, so I, I actually chose to make my environment a little bit more monk and a little bit less urban. And yep. you live in L.A. Right, even though you are an actual monk. So what are the differences between, say, practicing mindfulness in a place where you have peace or, or quiet outside and what you would do uh, in a more crowded environment? Like, like, just kind of walk me through it. Yeah, well, the, the first step is understanding that the way you schedule your day, the way you actually broker that peace happens in your own phone. It happens on your own schedule. And so if all I had to do today was hang out with Dave Asprey, it'd be a pretty chill day. But if I had 400 other things to do and I'm sitting here looking at my clock going, oh, damn, oh, damn, this is taking too long. Uh, suddenly there's this time compression. There's a stress. So you can curate your life however you need to, depending on what you say no to. Right. And that's where you and I get along so well. Right. Is because once you start powering up that, that prefrontal cortex, that, that ability to say no to things, that uh, that negation that you get in your brain that is, is accessible so that you don't reach for the Twinkie or the pumpkin pie and you say no to that, the, the calendar event that's gonna you know, basically punt your kids and your family off to some other time because you now just crowded out your day. Those are the things that you gotta manage first in an urban environment. And then from there, man, it's so easy to make better choices now. It's so easy to go to the store and just buy things that came from a good company, something that isn't poisoning you, uh, you know, get access to organic foods, get access to things that will be supportive of a, of a better world that we'd all like to see. Uh, so just because you live in a city, it doesn't mean that you might as well just be gargling whiskey and, and driving you know, an SUV and, and doing all these things that, that are um, kind of reckless in, in a way that says, well, you know, I can't do any good from here anyways. Uh, and then, you know, look, I don't care what city you're in. If you're in Manhattan, uh, which is kind of the biggest U.S. city here, there's parks everywhere and there's nature within a 10, 15 mile drive from the city. So it's not hard to get. It's just a matter of uh, a frame of reference and how we kind of schedule that in and value that in our lives. So, you know, if you don't have time in nature booked into your phone, then chances are you're probably not going to keep that appointment because it never showed up on your book. And so you live there, and so you've curated your life in a different way. Like you get out, you're in nature, and then you get on airplanes, and you're you're banging away for a week or two, and then you go back to your kind of you know reclusive abode and, and kind of gain gain your mojo back, right? Yeah, I lock myself in the hyperbaric oxygen chamber, shine lasers at my head, you know, natural stuff. Totally, <laughs> totally. <laughs> you get your gizmos. <laughs> They're in nature, though. I swear. Totally, right. <laughs> nature's right out there. <laughs> Like, no, and I mean that's yeah, and that's where you and I get along. I mean, I have an infrared sauna. I got all sorts of toys. I love what technology could bring if it's useful and it's mm -hmm. it's helping your physiology and helping kind of 
boost the output of energy in your system because that energy is like cash flow, man. Like you could use it for yeah. all kinds of things, but most people don't have enough energy. So they're suffering all day. And then they wonder when they go home, they don't have time to play with their kid. They wonder why their kid's not engaging and looking at their phone during the dinner table. It's because you're thinking about your morning and you're not sitting there with your kid either. So let's walk through what I'm doing, right? Because mm-hmm. you, you've made a study of this, and so have I. And I, I imagine we have some differences. So I agree. You put stuff on your phone, uh, on your calendar on your phone, I should say. Mm-hmm. And yeah. it, I'm assuming that a lot of people listening are, are at least somewhat using a calendaring application now. There's a few people who still have like notebooks and a few people just trying to remember everything. But I think that there's going to be fewer of them because it's actually really efficient to have a system just to track what you're going to do when. Um, I have my my day set up like every probably every 15 minutes uh, there's something sometimes there's the meetings an hour sometimes it's 45 minutes but basically there's no time wasted like when I, I decide to work like when I decide to start things are blocked out right and I found that if I'm doing it I'll always add stuff to the calendar right because it's really hard to know all right 50,000 people want to talk uh, you know whatever. I'm only going to say yes to some of them, but I don't like to say no, and I'm fully capable of saying no, but I don't have the, the cycles to sit down and prioritize and say, you know what, there's 10 people I could talk to today, which are the three most important ones, mm-hmm. right? And because I, I have other priorities, like I want to do a biohack, so today I'm going to do the infrared sauna, or today I'm going to uh, you know, spend some extra time with the kids, I'm going to pick them up from school today, and I schedule those on the calendar too. So my practice has been, I work with my executive assistant, and I'm like, could you help me prioritize things? Could you schedule this? So what I end up doing is I wake up in the morning. I'm like, I don't know. I have no idea what I'm doing today. And yeah. I look at the calendar. I'm like, okay. And I check it the night before when I go to bed. So I know if I have to like dress fancy or something. But for the most part, like I wake up and everything's there, all the info I need. And I, I, I execute. I'm kind of in a state of flow as much as I can. Am I doing it right? Yeah. I mean, that's, look, there's, there's many ways to do this. So, you know, there's... Um, it all depends on how your life runs and whether you've trained your executive assist, assistant to be, uh, you know, useful in that. And it sounds like you've kind of nailed that. Uh, what I what I like to do is I like to block off time for self care in the middle of my day. It's because, important, yeah. Yeah, because I'll, I'll spend, I, you know, I'll do the fifteen minute intervals and just bang through a thousand calls, and then I'll just be like, wow, I'm devastated. I need to go, you know, take a day out in nature or something. Whereas I found that if I, every 25 minutes, get up, walk around, I take all my calls standing, I have kettlebells, and you should see all the crap I have around this office. We have just yeah. toys everywhere. So everyone is like moving around and exercising and doing things all day because you stay active, your, your brain's working better. And so all that built in, what I also do is when something comes up, I will always weigh it against my 30, 60, 100 day goals and also look at my year goals. So I always have those lined up. And so if something comes up and it sounds interesting and I know that my 30 day goal is to get X, Y, or Z done, I'm going to be like, dude, I got to punt that to, you know, next quarter. Um, and I know my inclination is to say yes, whether I is me or my executive assistant or someone on my team. And I have people on my team that help me with my calendaring now just because so much stuff comes through. But, um, you know, you weigh it against what you told your, what you told you, you yourself you want, Right. And then in doing so, you can keep manifesting and getting things done instead of opening new applications and and not closing them out, right? And so for me, I like 15-minute increments for calls or Skypes. Uh, If something requires an hour, then, uh, you know, you've already kind of done your research and and you're going to, you know, have that open flow there. And if you're going to meet, like, I mean, I know so many people that are like, we should get lunch. Yeah, we should get lunch. And lunch is a serious commitment. No kidding. Right, you got to drive there, you got to sit down. What if you don't like the person? What if your conversation's over? So, you know, I think people are just a little too fickle with their personal time and then they, they're, they're broke with time. And so it's really easy for us to do that because we see open areas on the calendar. But if I had my gym time, my meditation time, my reading time, like I have a CEO day, I have an admin day, and I have days that they're allowed to kind of book in for appointments. And even that, they has to, even through that, it has to go through a filter because, look, I want to be of service to the things that I've already said yes to. And if I say yes to that next thing, what I've effectively done is said no to the things I've already said yes to, which then puts me into a stressful state. And I don't want to live there. So, so now you and I are talking. You're running well.org. You've written a book uh, that will probably hit the New York Times. And even if it doesn't, like we're both reasonably successful in to, to the point that we have executive assistants. 
and we're not talking like someone working offshore as a virtual assistant, but like people who are willing to understand uh, prioritization of the day. Okay, so we're in this incredible position of privilege and both of us are using it in service to millions of people literally and, and I, that's the only way I know how to do this. <laughs> but mm-hmm. what do we do for someone who, okay, let, let's say that you're, you know, you're mid-20s, uh, you're, you know, first, second job, you don't have a staff, you, you, you know, you, you're happy that you can make a car payment uh, and, you know, get yourself good quality coffee, right? So that isn't an option. How does a person who hasn't reached the level of success that you and I have, how do they handle the same problem? Which is like, you yeah. know, how, how do you say yes to some things and no to others? How do you manage your day so that you don't get all stressed out and just not take care of yourself? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. And that's pretty much how I've done it. Like I, I went kicking and screaming. I didn't want an executive assistant because I was a bit of a control freak, right? Like yeah. I was just like, no, I got this. Um, and then when I finally had to let it go is because I didn't want to handle all the email volume uh, that was coming in, right? And so we've got systems for email now. But I, mean, I did this myself for years, and I mm-hmm. actually advocate this because if you don't understand it, then it's really easy to kind of uh, break it and come in and break your own rules because you don't understand what happens when you break them. And so, again, taking your 30, 60, and 100-day goals, putting them into a document that you look at every single day, And then when new things come in and someone's like, hey, I'm from so-and-so and and I got this, you know, opportunity, you always stop. And it's just, it's it's like mindfulness now kind of extrapolating out into your schedule and just apply a a filter of mindfulness and say, okay, where does this fit into my universe with my goals this quarter, this week, this month, this year? And is this something that I need to necessarily have a meeting about this week? And then say, great, this sound, and then you don't have to be rude. I mean, people are so worried about saying no to people because they want people to like them, right? And just be like, no, this this sounds awesome. This is really exciting. This is excellent. We're in the middle of uh, making a movie this year. So uh, for fall 2017, this sounds like a project we'd really want to, you know, talk about. So I'm going to hook you up with the right people and uh, let's keep this conversation moving. And so I just said yes, but I didn't screw myself over by juxtaposing that on a schedule that was already tight. Right. And so that's what has really helped a lot of my students over the years manage it because, you know, time compression creates stress. And the things that I learned up uh, up on the mountains about how to bring that stress down had a lot to do with stepping out of time. And the way you step out of time is sure you have all these you know techniques and you can do breath work and meditation and neurofeedback and shoot one of Dave's lasers in your head and you know there's there's a lot of tactics to that but strategically if you just you know if you just stand in the ring you're gonna get punched in the face right so so curating your life and curating your time and understanding the flow of energy through your day is critical to then having this cushion to offset stress instead of constantly sitting there going like, oh, yeah, it's bleeding again, right? Which is how most people deal with it. All right, so in The Urban Monk, tell me like your top three recommendations for people who manage their own, their own day calendar that you, would, that you would make based on the principles in the book, just the top three recommendations for, all right, like here's how to get control of your day. Like, like do you turn off alerts or like, like there's gotta be some just ways of, of specific technology things you do. Great, great. Well, I mean, the, the easiest one, which isn't like the biggest one, but I'll mention first, is go unsubscribe to everything that isn't relevant. Like, you, you know, there's apps for that too. You just go and just kind of blanket unsubscribe to things that you don't want to hear about kind of thing. Because we all just kind of get caught into this email barrage. And then the, this, the, the tail end of that would also be chunk email time. Like, I don't start my day with people's demands of me. Yep. I start my day getting up knowing this is what I'm doing in my, my freshest, brightest, kind of most alert hours is I'm going to get this thing done. I don't feel good about it because what will happen if not is I'm just going to, you know, basically answer emails and wash up on the beach of like crazy land. And then, you know, by the end of the day, I'd be like, holy crap, I still got all the stuff to do. And now I'm feeling anxious. I'm going to be, you know, resentful of my kids who want to hang out with me. I'm going to, you know, it just it creates this cascade of, of um, imbalance that isn't really cool. Um, and then the other one that I had alluded to that I think is really important to manage your day is to take a break. I like I, I use Pomodoro as an app for this, but there's a lot of them for it. I have it beep every 25 minutes. I take five minutes every 25 minutes, and what I'll do is a minimum of 10. And I'm kind of you know I'm more aggressive with it, so I'll do five sets of 10 of something. So I'll do 
uh, 10 squats, 10 lunges, 10 push-ups, you know, 10 jumping jacks, 10, you know, whatever kicks or what, whatever it is. Uh, go get some water, go to the bathroom, ideally go outside, get some sunshine, uh, you know, stretch out a little bit, back in, right? And just take a couple breaths before you get back in. And you look at all the productivity studies, man, it's, it's so much better for us to just take a little pause and get back in than to think we're doing well by just pushing through things. And that, it's just, it hasn't proven to work. We all, you know, look at corporate America, and everyone's beat up and they're, you know, exhausted because we think more is better. And so taking that time not only gets the blood flowing to your brain, um, what that does is it then helps keep your, your blood flowing so that your endocrines are pumping and you're not needing coffee to try to get back into your day. Because then when you start saying, oh crap, I can't focus, this is, this is trouble, you go over to the pot of coffee yeah. and you start hitting it all day, every day, yeah, it's, it's it, trouble. Look, it and sucks. I'm talking to the coffee guy. I'm talking to the coffee guy here, right? So if, look, you know, I'm going to qualify if, this. If people are watching now, I'm actually drinking coffee right he's, as you're he's saying drinking, that on purpose. Yeah. <laughs> he, he, he's drinking coffee right now, right. And so like, I'll have coffee in the morning and go, but if I'm having coffee at three o'clock because I can't keep yeah, my eyes that's open. that's a problem. It's a problem, right. So you know what? You, you use your coffee as a tool when it's appropriate. By the way, I have to, to just kind of for a second there. People think I drink coffee all day. I actually drink one cup in the morning and this is my second cup and only other cup of coffee today. Normally it's one cup in the day. So I, I agree with you. If you're using coffee to stay awake all day like I used to, um, number one, your coffee's probably bad. But number two, you're going to jack yourself up. Like it's not okay. So That's full it. support That's Full it. support on what you're saying. Yes, yes. Love you, Dave Asprey. This is, this is why we get along is you, look, you're a sensible dude. And look, at the end of the day, it's like, you know, you can't swipe on your credit card all day long and not expect a big bill to come in. And so once you, if you're drinking coffee all day long, then really your nice. blood sugar goes unstable, your cortisol gets messed up, and then you're just, you're agitated. So use coffee for the powerful, wonderful drug tool that it is when you, when it's appropriate to do it so it doesn't mess up your sleep cycles and all that other stuff. And then do what Dave says, which is, exercise and, 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 you know, do all these other wonderful things to kind of boost your metabolism the rest of the time so that you don't need to keep going back and like, you know, jacking up your blood sugar. That's a major recommendation. Take, take some, take some time so that you can reset multiple times during the day, right? Yes. Yes, okay. and absolutely. And use a Pomodoro counter, but most of the time Pomodoro is like 50 minutes then 10 minutes, but you do 25 minutes of work in five I, minutes. I, I found 25, I've done 50 and 10 uh, for some, you know, we, we do uh, wellness for 2,200 companies uh, over at well.org. So I got a lot of uh, employee base to be able to like draw conclusions on and we've tried a lot of things. And I got to say personally, and for a lot of the companies I've been kind of uh, directing on this, 25 and 5, so every half hour taking a quick five minute break has been very, very helpful because what happens is right around that 20 to 30 minute mark, if you're, especially if you're sitting, and I'm a big fan of the standing desk, if you're sitting right around that 25 to 30 minute mark is when the kind of the flow shuts down, the ion flow shuts down, and you start seeing the kind of the, the challenges with uh, sitting and all the studies that have come out that, that kind of slow the metabolism and, and are bad for your health and all that. So, you know, I've, I've actually, we've had uh, DVT pumps, like having like calf pumps at people's desks, um, standing desks, but whatever it is, if you can keep the body moving and you keep the body moving regularly, then it's cueing for a higher metabolic rate. It's moving more energy to the brain and it's having you require less adjustments in your blood sugar slash caffeine to get through your day, it, right? It's kind of funny. Um, I'm sitting down right now at the new set uh, at... at Bulletproof Labs, and I'm in this badass chair. I'm turning around. People on YouTube can actually see this. It's like a hammered metal aircraft chair from the 50s. Like, it's cool. Right? But it's a chair, right? And I'm sitting here, like, like uncomfortable because I use a standing desk. So I think I'm actually going to take my stand desk, uh, which is the, like an electric up-down uh, desk that I use. Um, and I'm, uh, uh, I'm an advisor to the, the founder when he first started the company, and he's, he's cruising along. But um, I'm going to take that and actually make it part of the set because I want to stand when I record these because at my old desk, I used to record at my desk, now I'm recording in a studio, but I'm actually less comfortable, and I'm, like, I'm feeling it right now. So you're standing at your studio because you thought about this, right? Well, you know what's funny is, so we had like these you know, kind of professional set designers come, and we have these chairs. Well, here, for the people on YouTube, we've got, you know, we've got these chairs that oh, we orange. have, like that we sit around, the orange chairs that sit around on this Urban Monk set. 
Um, and, you know, it was fine. You do a few shows and we have the health bridge set over there. And, um, you know, after a while, what I started realizing is the days after um, the, the shoot days, I was just getting crankier and my, my hip flexors were tighter. And yeah. just, things were getting crunchy. And I was like, what the hell? Right? Why, why is there an exception on your filming days? Because, right. like it's, yeah. It's totally, yeah. So like, that, that, that I was have it. problems here. Like, there we go. All right. That's Come better. on. Right. <laughs> I can do this. I can do this. All right. You need to watch YouTube. I just put my ankle behind my head on yep. the air. That was awesome. There, yep. I feel better. My hip flexors are totally legit now. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Pedro. <laughs> you saved my day, Mr. Urban Monk. <laughs> Problem solved. <laughs> Oh man, yeah. And so, so this is it, right? It's like, so here I am, a guy that like gives this recommendation to all these people in corporate America, and I find myself sitting for like a twelve-hour filming day, going, yeah. "What, what, what just happened here?" It's brutal. Right? Yeah, and, and like you know, I, I wrote the check for the set. Like I could have just as easily said, "No, everyone stands," but I just you know I wasn't paying attention. Same here. I'm fixing right? it. Right, and it, yeah, and so it was just like, no, uh, uh-uh, because you can't afford to sit that long. Right, like the only time like I sit for prolonged periods of time is in airplanes, and now it's like I, I, I go for aisle seats and try to get up and walk around as much as I can because you know you got to be there. I always get the aisle seat, and the other thing. Now we're just kind of getting off topic. I'm sure this isn't in the Urban Monk, but um, I use compression sleeves uh, on my lower legs. Like if you fly a lot, you're crazy not to do that. You, you, normally, you just buy them from like a CrossFitter store, but these are just like either compression socks that go over your feet, uh, which you can buy like at Walgreens and they look like you're wearing pantyhose or you can get like orange and green armor plated some things. Uh, but uh, I get the sleeves that don't cover my feet. And you know, it keeps the blood pressure from, or the blood from pooling in your, in your legs, keeps the blood pressure where it should be. And you actually feel better when you land. So I, I'm a huge fan of, of even that, anything to just keep the blood moving. Yep. So there's actually a, a shirt that I wear every time. It's uh, by a company called Intelliskins. Uh, oh yeah, Tim I Brown. have one of yeah, those. Great. And um, you know, it's the the studies he sent me on this were pretty cool. Is that the the frequency um, that you're in when you're kind of rattling around in an airplane or a car shuts down the postural muscles, and so everything just kind of falls apart. So that's why we feel so beat up when we travel. And so I always wear my compression shirt and compression socks when I travel. Because I got to get off and like talk on a stage or something. It's like I don't have a down day. And if I had a down day, then I would schedule my travel differently because I'd take my kid to Disneyland or something. Like why would I Why would I schedule a down day when I could spend more time with my family and get that work-life balance? So, so Pedro, I've also heard that you actually are a fan of Spanx. Do you actually wear Spanx for the compression? I'm wearing, I'm, I'm wearing them right now. <laughs> <laughs> See, I can always go there with you, and, and you just never bite on any of this, man. I've, I've never gotten you, you to, to ever just feel like, I don't know what to say. All right. It, it's, it's hard to make a brown guy blush, by the way. Oh, oh that's the trick. All right, I, I got to remember that. All right, let's switch gears since you're a doctor of oriental medicine, and uh, let's talk about uh, something that you wrote, on, wrote about on well.org. And this was a study from Columbia University that said that there's a connection between the month a baby's born and their risk for diseases later in life. What's your take on that? Does this tie back to origins, your movie, or like, like what's the deal? You know, it's, it's just funny because I, I spent my whole life looking, you know, I've been on both sides of the fence. You know, I was you know, very sciencey at UCLA and then I went off and, you know, went off with the wizards and, and studied all sorts of kind of cool metaphysical stuff. And you know, I just never really threw my hat in for astrology because I was like, I don't know, right? Yeah, but, exactly. Uh, you know, o- over the years, I got to say, it's just like, damn, that is pretty consistent, right? And, and so there's all sorts of really interesting patterns that emerge that these ancients have been talking about that we're becoming more and more aware of. And people were very religious about it back in the day and were just like, it is what it is because someone said so. And I just couldn't ever buy that. Right. But now it's, you know, it's just an interesting kind of uh, window to keep open in my mind. And so as data comes in and starts to also show that maybe maybe there are correlations with birth month and and behavioral, uh, you know, kind of changes and all sorts of things that we see in people. um, To me, that's fascinating because how the hell did they know, first of all? And secondly, what else can we what, what else can we glean? How can how can we time um, the con- conception of our children to kind of create the ideal personalities that match, say, yourself and your spouse? Or, you know, what, what, else do we, what else do we open up out of this Pandora's box that can help us be 
better humans, better parents. And so for me, that, that kind of stuff is just fascinating. And, you know, I don't know if this article means anything, but when I see stuff like that, it's just like, hey, hey, this is cool, right? And, and we should look at it. And I wish more people were looking at that um, and the, the, the fungus that you talked about starting this show um, than some stuff we do look at in science, right? I mean, there's a lot of really interesting innovation happening uh, that could help us understand ourselves better, make the world a better place, make us you know, just better inhabitants of this planet. And there's, um, you know, there's funding that's now being allocated for that. And so I'm a big fan of where things are going and how conscious capital is changing uh, those things. So it's one of those, it's one of those things where you, you can dig in on, on conscious capitalism and, and things like that. But I think there's a direct effect. The environment programs us. And I didn't, realize the extent of that when I first started looking at epigenetics and you look at fertility and, and things like that and you realize, okay, you know, our genes are turned on and off by the environment, but it kind of makes sense even with, if you're not looking at, you know, was I born under like rising Uranus or anything like, like I know people who use astrology and they seem to know weird stuff. Like, like I, I'm not dismissing it. I'm just saying I have no idea. But I do think though, if you're born in spring, like most animals are born in spring for a reason, because then there's lots of food in summer. And then when winter comes, you have enough fat that you can survive the winter. Like we're animals, we're kind of wired that way, right? So if you're born in December, well, okay, then are you likely to have more diabetes? I, I don't know from the specific study, but it actually would make sense. Like, okay, like if you came out in, in a part of the world where the, the light and the temperature uh, and things like that were different. So on one hand, the, the skeptic would say, yeah, it's all you know, a bunch of crap blah, blah, blah. But when you dig in on it, like it actually makes sense that the environment would say if you're born at one time versus another, you might be more likely to partition your calories a certain way. You might burn fat differently. You might have even different genes that are turned on in the womb. We, we just don't know. But when you look at big data and you look at, well, wait, there's these disturbing patterns and maybe they're just random. We just, they just happen to happen. Or maybe there's enough evidence that we should start paying attention. And I think we're at the cusp of, um, uh, the cusp of, of realizing that there's a lot more going on than we thought, because when you look at the numbers, they don't lie. That's it. That's it. I mean, that, you know, statistically speaking, these things are relevant. And so I know, I know a couple um, groups of physicians that are looking at the expression of uh, different hormones based on uh, seasons and how, you know, the body's kind of nuanced hormonal systems will then impact our, our psychology, they'll impact our physiology, they'll impact all kinds of things. So it's just, you know, the interesting stuff can't be boxed in anymore. It used to be, you know, if you wanted to get some medical research done, uh, you got to go find some patron, right? It's like, mm -hmm. you know, some drug company's got to pay for you for what they're interested in seeing. And now it's just the world's getting so interesting and there's enough kind of interesting um, money moving or interested money moving around into some of this where cool things are getting funded. Not enough, absolutely not enough, but cool things are getting funded. And one of my biggest contentions with, you know, the, the model for science that, that we kind of are shaking out of here is that if you have a hypothesis and then certain data shows up that then challenges that hypothesis and breaks it, then you as a scientist need to go back and formulate a new hypothesis. And the kind of establishment science had gotten really lazy and said like, oh yeah, we, we, we see that study, but we're just going to ignore it and put it over there because that breaks our worldview and our model. And that just starts, that starts to sound like religiosity, right? That, that starts to really break ranks with what science is. And so good science just looks at data. And now we have really interesting data coming in that's making the world and the universe way more interesting than what, you know, Beaver Cleaver's universe looked like. That's why I'm a fan of the quantified self because it, it illuminates things that, that shouldn't be. Uh, one, of, one of the most frustrating things that, that I run across, and probably you do too, is you get these, uh, we'll, we'll just call them self-validating skeptics, and, and the line goes something like this, that didn't happen because it can't, right? Yeah. Okay, that is completely anti-science. Okay, if, if someone presents data or someone has a, something that actually is happening and happens dozens or hundreds or tens of thousands of times, but it, it violates a belief, a theory, a hypothesis that you believe to be true, right? And all of a sudden, like, okay, if this happens one time, then the hypothesis is provably false, at least in some cases. That means it's not always true. But the gut reaction of, of our ape-level humans 
is to actually say that what happens didn't happen because it would violate a law versus a hypothesis. And, and I see that all the time. Like, how could eating more fat make you lose fat? Well, okay, at this point, geez, Robert Atkins wrote a book the year I was born about how to do this. Like, it's not, uh, it's not a question of whether it's possible, but you still run across people who do this. And yeah. with some of the stuff that you were, that you do, you know, I mean, Chinese medicine, acupuncture, that kind of stuff, bedroom, I mean, you face a huge numbers of naysayers, um, you being acupuncturists and, and Chinese medicine people, yet, what do you know? There's only like a billion people who rely on this to stay healthy. Um, what do you what do you recommend that that people do when they're dealing with the naysayers? And I'm just asking this as a, an urban monk kind of perspective. Yeah, yeah. I think there's a big uh, juxtaposition of belief versus experience here, right? And so you know, the, the flip side of that naysayer is the person that says this is true because God said so, right? <laughs> it, it, you're like, uh, you know, give me something to work with, right? And, yeah. and so I don't really ask anyone uh, to believe in acupuncture. Right. Um, I invite them to experience it, there you right? Go. And, and that's it. It's just like, hey, check it out. I don't, don't even go there, right? Just experience it. If it. And if it helps you, then your experience of acupuncture was positive. And that has been for, you know, millions of people over thousands of years and the stuff works, right? Uh, and so the, you know, there's a lot of people who have a dog in the race. And so there are naysayers um, that are coming from establishments that are funded by, you know, uh, just special interests. I don't want to get too conspiracy theory, but, you know, you got to follow the money in a lot of the, the science medical sure. thing here, right? And, and because of that, you know, when I first came out and I was kind of wet behind the ears, I was just like very defensive about it. Um, and now I just, I don't even pay any right. interest or energy <laughs> into it, right? It's just like, dude, you can live there all you want and enjoy that neck pain. Mm -hmm. uh, but these people over here, they're fine. Right, like they're they're not sitting on that rock, uh, uh, stuck in some sort of belief system, and, uh, and, and masquerading that they're still talking science. Right, you can have your beliefs and, and sit there, and you know it's a free country, and that's great. But you know, don't go masquerading a, a belief system as science, and then walking around trying to browbeat people with that because that's that's just kind of that that's not cool. Um, very very well said, and it it's not cool, and and I think it's catching on more online now. I, I see this all over the place. Um, what what still bothers me though is, is people who are spreading misinformation and don't know they're doing it and are actually causing a lot of harm to others, right? And yeah. and so one of the things I'm working on, on doing is you know put more science references in, in the stuff you write, and mm -hmm. it's it's really cool where there's a hypothesis. You're like, well, you know, there's 15 things, and some of them are animals, some of them are not, but they say that there is something happening here that isn't what the common belief system is, so it's worthy of consideration. And like, this is how human progress happens. It's how meditation happens. And it's probably what happened, you know, 2,000 years ago when uh, people were meditating in caves saying, well, maybe I'll pay attention to that and see what happens. And, and if we don't, as a group, like direct our attention to things where there's something going on and we'd like to know what it is, um, it, it feels like, like we're missing out on, on a lot. And, and you've done something, the reason I'm asking all this stuff, you've been writing lately about uh, symbiotic capitalism and what you're doing with well.org and decentralized philanthropy. And just take a minute. I don't know how much of that you've put into the Urban Monk, but just take a minute to talk about what, what happens with capitalism, how all that, all that works, because I think you have an unusual perspective on it given your history. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I started my, my first movie. I, it was you know, a bit critical of the healthcare system because it was a sick care, <laughs> just, just sick a care model. <laughs> just, just a bit, just a bit. Um, and like, you know, was, I got to say, I, this was vitality. Uh, vital so. Vitality, yeah. yeah. And, and you know, I pulled a couple punches because I didn't realize that you, know, um, you shouldn't uh, back then. And uh, you know, then I started following that into the environment and just this, this kind of masquerade um, that we're in where it's like, we don't know why everyone's getting sick. It's like, well, there's 72 billion pounds of chemicals being added into the environment every single day and no one's saying, hey, maybe that might be a problem, right? And so the movie you're in, Origins, was, you know, was, was that. It was kind of like, just follow that story. And then as I followed that story, it really became a follow the money kind of story. And I, and I started looking at the history. We're, we're filming a movie on this next year. The history of capitalism, what it was, and, and how it came over, and you know, obviously long story short, because we got a whole movie on this coming, and there, it's a big story, but when we in America here, because I know you're sitting in Canada, when we started looking at uh, you know, breaking away from England and getting independence and, and doing things differently, one of the things that snuck through was this corporate charter, 
Where in the old days, the king or the queen would have to just be like, uh, you want a corporation, why? Okay, that's, that's okay, that's good for the crown, I'm going to uh, give you a charter. And so we uh, you know, kind of made that a local magistrate's position. So now you wanted a corporation. So someone, someone would have to look at this and say, is this good for the commons? And uh, yes or no, if yes, then I'll grant you the right to be a corporation. Sometime in the late 1880s, that all went away. And what that meant was any sociopath could create an entity that had rights on its own and its, its absolute purpose was to maximize profit for its shareholder. Yes. And so what happens with that is that then you start to offset every externality that you can onto the commons, which is, you know, the air, the water, the kind of public commons, public lands, because then you're maximizing profits and you're doing what you're supposed to do. And it is well within your right and that is the law. And so a lot of very smart people have been looking at this lately saying, man, this is, you know, this is what's melting the icebergs. Like, what the hell are we doing? And so how can we create a way to do business that also looks after the commons, that also takes care of the stakeholders and so legally, the, the directors of this corporation can't get sued for, you know, doing something nice for the planet because they didn't maximize profit. And so right. there's this whole kind of uh, B Corp and benefit for benefit kind of sector that's emerging. Companies doing great stuff. I mean, I am, I've got the coolest life in the world just following these stories and these people because, man, they are, they are moving the needle. Are you going to be a B Corp? Oh yeah, we're already in our transition. Well.org's uh, B Corp and um, everything we're doing is very much aligned to uh, really kind of cleaning up the supply chain. Oh yeah, uh, so of, much work, but I'm working on that too, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is this is supply the conversation. Okay. You're doing well. You're doing this for your, for your kids' kids, right? You're doing this for a future yeah. of, of a planet that's going to be much more sane and sustainable, right? I know you, I mean, we're buddies. So like, this, yeah. is, this, is, what, this is what gets me up in the morning is, is making sure that we're fighting the right fight. So, so since you're the first guy I've interviewed, uh, I think, who's going into the B Corp thing. I, I've looked really heavily at being a B Corp. I'm not sure that the way the B Corp charters are currently done, and I'm speaking as a, as a warden MBA kind of guy, I'm not sure that they don't put B Corps at a disadvantage over C Corps because of the reporting requirements. Like, I, I don't yeah. want to telegraph what I'm doing to the C Corps that will do this. So, I mean, I, I paid out of pocket for Moldy, a documentary about something that's really important, like mold in houses that isn't a major part of my, uh, part of my business. Um, and I, I do a lot of other charitable kinds of activities. And it's, it's one of those things where I don't want to, you know, I, I don't want to share information with competitors, even though I'm fine to share it with stakeholders, right? I haven't sorted through that one, but I, I'm looking at yeah. the B Corp thing. I, I can, I can just say to that point that there is a very uh, nice conversation happening in Washington D.C. on both sides of the aisle with some very serious people that are looking at that very thing and looking at ways to incentivize companies to step into that space and not give up competitive advantage. Yeah. Uh, and so it's, yeah, it's a big conversation, but it's the conversation of our time because for, you know, several generations now, the charters of these corporations have allowed and, and almost, you know, kind of tacitly uh, required them to dump off everything they could onto the commons. Now we're like, hey, well, we can't afford the healthcare crisis. Oh, we, you know, how are we going to clean up the air pollution? Well, we absorb that into the commons because we let companies do that, right? Agreed. And so... It's it's huge. It's it's really big, and so one of you know there's a whole chapter on that in the Urban Monk book. But it's about kind of stepping in and, and tapping into your own vitality and stepping into your own life of purpose and, and and having the energy to actually be able to do things in your life and have agency, and then being the conscious consumer on one end, so you don't yeah. buy crap from companies that are that are you know sinking the ship, and then getting involved in, in directing your company to also clean up supply chains and do things. We could we could fix this in a couple generations, uh, okay. but we have to start now. All right, big conundrum for you. You're probably the only guy I, I would think of to ask this uh, ask about this on the air. All right, it, it's a moral question or an ethics question. All right, big bad company does something good. Do you spend money on the good thing they did? Um, you, 
this is this is a huge problem with greenwashing now. Yeah, a lot of these companies are getting bought up by big bad companies, uh -huh. and so and some of it's kind of really douchey, and they're they're changing out their ingredients and making them bad too. Mm -hmm. And some of it is like, hey, we'll just leave you alone because you're profitable, and we understand that language. So that's a real fine line. I think that we um, are seeing Walmart and Costco and a lot of these companies who are interested in making profit now being some of the biggest you know kind of uh, procurers of organic products. Because people are saying, if you provide it, I will buy it from you. And so it's creating behavioral change on a macro level for companies to yeah. also have an opportunity. So I'm not, you know, like Mother Teresa said, I would never go to an anti-war rally, but I'll go to a pro-peace rally. Yeah. I think that, you know, this isn't some sort of like intrinsic evil, like they're not building a Death Star that we're going to have to blow up. Uh, and, and, you know, I've met evil people in the world, but I don't see that necessarily is the case. I just see it as a system that can now be nudged and nuanced and, and things can be forgiven. And like, let's just, let's just head in this direction now. Right. And yeah. so to answer your question specifically, yeah, I would, I would buy something from a big bad company doing the right thing just to say, yeah, keep it going. That's one of the things that, that I, I, I deal with. Nestle pretty much has an evil point of view. I mean, they're taking advantage of the commons, you know, screwing water supplies everywhere. But, um, their San Pellegrino water, which they bought, it, it was actually a, a healing spring for, since like 1500 or something. It's actually one of the better bottled waters. And I've, I read a post about it. People are like, you're supporting the devil. I'm like, well, no. Like Nestle does bad things. Their CEO thinks water isn't a right, which is absurd. But they sell water that I can buy in restaurants that's in a glass bottle instead of plastic, um, which, is, which is pretty good, right? And, and I appreciate yeah. that. So uh, the, the fact that... that that's available, I'm willing to buy it, even though it's from a company I don't like. And, and that's a really tough thing when you're dealing with multi-billion dollar companies, uh, where you're trying to allocate your, your spend consciously to support good companies. If there's another mineral water with good quality minerals that isn't from them, I'm probably going to buy that instead. Yeah. And then, and then the bigger dilemma is, you know, if you're a San Pellegrino and you are now being uh, enticed with a really nice size check and say you could move to Tahiti and live for the rest of your life and never worry about money... Do you sell to the devil? And yeah. and so you know the, it, it's complicated, you know. Yeah. And so this is this is a very important conversation. I think that you know supporting Nestle to do the right thing and supporting the shareholders of Nestle yep. to oust that CEO and bring in someone who gives a damn is also <laughs> a way, right? Because yep. you don't have to. You can change if you have stock in a company as a shareholder. You can step in there and be like, "Hey, what the hell are we doing over here?" And yeah. let's put let's put someone at the helm that isn't going to be so destructive, right? And so there's a lot of ways of going about this, uh, but you know, this is. I mean, if this is interesting to anyone who's listening to this, this isn't something about like saying, "Oh, great, I can't wait to see what Pedram and Dave are going to do about it." You know, yeah. you yeah. need to step into this in your own life, right? Like with every time you swipe your card at, at the store, every single purchase means something. And so that's power. That's that's like economic democracy yeah. in a lot of in ways. In fact, every single purchase probably means more than your vote. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. That's it. There's a lot more going into commerce than there is into campaign finance. There's also this idea. You said you know you've met evil people. I think everyone has, but they're usually not in charge of big things because it's hard to be in charge when you're that evil. What I find it is that there's an emergent behavior. When you set a whole bunch of tiny rules to maximize profit, just like you're talking about, you create systems. Like Essentially, companies act like psychopaths or sociopaths. If companies were people, they, would, they don't act in the right way because they were set up based on millions of tiny decisions. But it's not like, like there's, at least at most companies, an evil puppet master going, you know, I'm going to wreck the world. It, it's, it's not like that. And I've worked with CEOs and I've worked with boards and you go in there, and then they're genuinely people trying to do the right thing, and oftentimes dumbfounded that it doesn't come out of the system, and it's it, it's an invisible thing. Just like I thought I was going to do something that made me healthy, and now I'm fat and tired, but I thought I was doing it right. It, it's an emergent thing that happens after many, many small decisions. Yeah, and then you know you hang with a lot of kind of high level CEOs, as do I, and. It almost seems like those conversations that happen around nuclear non-proliferation. It's like, <laughs> all right, you stop making nukes and then I'll stop making nukes. You take out five, I'll take out five, right? Because they have all these competitors and it's so hard to do the right thing and just not get wiped out on the market. 
um, because the competitor uh, has less morals than you. And so they're, you know, even when trying to do the right thing, this is where I think, you know, this is why conscious capitalism is such an important movie topic for me is because as consumers, when we wake up and we're like, oh, hell no, you do that, I'm never buying your stuff again. That then creates this level of transparency that, you know, and kind of accountability that will shift. And we're seeing it shift in corporate culture because the consumer is not just like, okay, I'm just going to go down to my Walmart and buy my whatever commodity. It's like, why, why would I buy this? Who made it? What's it about? And, what, and who are you? And who, why, why should I buy it from you? Those are important questions that we stopped asking. So, so Pedro, we're coming up on the end of the podcast. Unfortunately, I could talk with you for hours and we'd, we'd Probably a lot of people want to listen just because I don't know. I think you, you say some interesting stuff. Um, and normally I ask the same question, and it's one that I've asked every guest. But I already asked you your top three recommendations for people to kick more ass, and you had some some great answer. I think it evolved like kale and something. No, I'm kidding. Um, but <laughs> but uh, since I already asked that, what I want to ask you is something that's special because your book is just coming out, uh, The Urban Monk at theurbanmonk.com. The top three most important pieces of advice in your book for people who want to kick more ass. Yeah, great. Uh, number one, and I, you know, this is going to sound like a broken record, but if you are eating food that your body doesn't see as food, <laughs> you're spending more energy fighting it than you're getting from the food. Terrible economics. Okay, so eat food that comes from nature and understand how to eat. You know, go go on the bulletproof diet. Eat real food. Uh, to me, that is absolutely critical. You cannot get away without that. Um, there are a lot of things that we talk about in the book, so I'm just going to pick the next one out of the hat. Um, if you are running your day thinking that tomorrow is when you're going to catch your breath, you are in big trouble. Because tomorrow's got its own set of BS and stuff. So you have to adjust your burn rate to find balance every single day so that you're not saying things like, oh, I can't believe it's only Tuesday. You know, this weekend I'm going to catch my breath. It's going to be so much better. Um, and just to kind of tie this in with the conscious capital piece, the third one I would say is if you're feeling like the world is crap and everything is crazy and everything's going to hell in a handbasket and there's nothing we can do about it, you need to understand that that lonely, destitute place is exactly where the TV wants to peg you into a corner so you can <laughs> kind of vote away your rights. And you need to understand that there are some amazing people doing amazing things yep. in this world. So you need to step up and get involved in your own life so that then you can be a beacon of light in your community and be part of all the stuff that Dave and I have been talking about, which is making a better world for our children's children and stepping, stepping up for that. Beautiful. Uh, Pedram, give me all of your URLs, at least the biggest ones. It's theurbanmonk.com for your book, well.org for your main info site. What, where else can people find you? You know what? That's it. Everything can get triaged from there. So I have the Health Bridge and the Urban Monk uh, podcasts uh, and shows on YouTube and all that, but then you get those through you know, the, the well.org URL. And uh, yeah, that's, that's where I hang out. Well.org has been my baby. Uh, the Urban Monk is great. I get to cuss. I get to you know, speak my mind and you know, just kind of tell it like it is. And so I'm, I'm having a good time. The internet's made it very easy to just have raw conversations that are actually important and meaningful. And like this one here. I love you, Dave. Well, lo love you, Pedro. And thank you for being on Bulletproof Radio. And just thanks for being a friend. I, I love getting to hang out with you. And congratulations on your new baby. It, it's so amazing. If you appreciated today's episode as much as I did, I love Pedram, just a great human being, head on over to bulletproof.com and do something for yourself that's going to make your brain work better. Today, think about brain octane. This is the oil that goes in Bulletproof coffee. It's not MCT oil. MCT oil is four kinds of oil, and it turns out that two of them don't work. The other two do work, but one of them works much better than the other. So we use a lot more coconut oil to make brain octane than MCT oil. Normal MCT oil, if you define it the way the chemists do and the way it's sold, is 1.6 times stronger than coconut oil. Brain octane is 16 times stronger than coconut oil. And it's the stuff that I use every morning. In fact, I pour a little bit of it on my lunch. I put it in my dinner. It's in my salad dressing. I put it everywhere. And when I do that, my brain works at this level all day long. When I don't do that, 
I'm not as powerful as I normally am. So if you want to pay attention to your hunger, to your willpower, to your food cravings, think about using Brain Octane more than you do now. It's not just for Bulletproof Coffee. It's something you can add to meals to influence the ketone levels in your body so that you have more stable energy throughout the day. And that's pretty amazing. That has literally changed how my brain works. It's changed my life. And when you have stable energy, you have stable emotions. When you have stable emotions, you're nicer to the people around you. And then you get to hang out with Pedram. It's just how it works. Have an awesome day.